All right, so we need to just solve some problems today, and hopefully that'll help us be prepared for the exam next time. I did want to just go back and revisit this one topic because it's a matter of perspective. Sometimes you'll have a device, maybe it's an engine, and it throws a lot of fluid out at a high speed out the back of it. The way we've analyzed it, we have to introduce a force in this direction as shown on that object to hold the object stationary. From the perspective of something outside of the control volume, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so the, you can think about it as the engine or what's inside the control volume will push in the opposite direction with that equal magnitude force. Here, I've shown it right here. So often we'll talk about the engine has generated a thrust force. That forward thrust force in the opposite direction that the fluid is going out of the back of it at high speed. And that is the force that is exerted on quote unquote the surroundings. Maybe the surroundings is part of a wing of an aircraft or something else. But sometimes you, you, you have to struggle with what direction is this thrust force acting in. So we have a water sprinkler with two sprayers at the end of a 120 millimeter long shaft. So each shaft is 120 millimeters. And it turns uh, at the end of the shaft 90 degrees, but then it also turns upward uh, 30 degrees. And then it sprays into the air the water through the nozzle with a diameter of four millimeter. It rotates at 35 RPM, and you can convert 35 RPM to 3.6652 radians per second, so that's what omega is. And um, the total flow rate into the device is 0 0.125 liters per second. That's a volumetric flow rate. You can convert that because it is water to mass flow rate, 0 0.125 kilograms per second. And then the two arms are symmetric, so one half of the mass flow rate that goes into the sprinkler goes out one arm and the other half goes out the other arm. <coughs> Calculate the friction torque at the sprinkler pivot. So the uh, friction torque is going to be opposite direction that it rotates. And that friction torque we could give a symbol tau sub f or t sub f. So we'll do this. We'll introduce a control volume. Look down at the pivot and the arms. Introduce a control volume. that's going to rotate at the same speed it's going to rotate with the arms okay and what we're interested in is uh, uh, calculate take doing a angular momentum balance around this axis that goes through the center and uh, this will be the positive direction uh, of increasing using the right-handed rule if it's rotating in this direction, that's a positive rotation or a positive. If it's a torque in that direction, it's a positive torque, etc. So we'll do the angular momentum balance for that control volume as shown. And so the only applied moment or force is that torque, and it's acting in the negative direction of rotation about that axis. It, then we have the fluid exiting, looking at top down. The fluid's exiting at this location and that location. Because the fluid's exiting, it wants to exert a, uh, well, first of all, let's just talk about the V. The V is in this direction for the fluid exiting. And if you have an R coming out, and I have a V in that direction, and R cross V, um, for that torque, it'll be M dot R cross V, true. 
and uh, both of them are exiting the control volume so I'm not gonna if you have one then you uh, add the other both of them have a mass flow rate of m dot divided by two you have two of them so the two is going to cancel but let's just talk about this r cross v for a minute using your right hand looking at r cross v would that induce negative or a positive direction for that it'll be a neg it'll be a negative right so basically we'll put a negative and then we'll have, I'll leave the 2 and the m dot divided by 2 for a second longer. And then we're going to have r cross v. Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to get rid of the, uh, uh, we'll drop it to a scalar notation because we know it's around that axis and it's in the negative direction. And it's now just r times v and because they are perpendicular. But now we have to work on what that v is. Now we have to work on what that V is. So it needs to be the velocity that's in that plane. And so we do need to take into consideration the 30 degrees. So uh, if you have the volumetric flow rate, AV, which is right here, you divide it by two, that's the volumetric flow rate going out each arm. And you divide by the area of the exit that will give you the velocity that is leaving the arm right here, right? And then if I want to get the component that is um, in the plane, I'd multiply that by the cosine of 30 degrees to pick off that one component in the plane. That's the velocity that, of the fluid leaving the tip in the x direction or in that plane I shouldn't say x direction but it's in that plane but the control volume is also rotating isn't it and so because it's rotating that tip has a speed and what we want to do is we want to calculate the velocity that it's uh, coming out of the uh, crossing that um, it's we know that it's crossing the control volume, but the control volume's rotating. So we have a um, subtract off omega r. It's because it's rotating with omega. And it's located at distance, maybe not r, put l there. All right, so that was a little challenging because we have to account for the the rotation out at the tip because of the sprinklers rotate, rotating, and that's going to decrease the effective um, uh, velocity for the uh, uh, moment consideration. And then we also have to account for that cosine of 30 degrees. So let's go ahead. If you have a calculator, we'll run this. 0.125 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed per second divided by 2, divided by pi, the diameter is 0 0.004 meters squared, put the 4 up here, pi d squared over 4. All right, then the cosine of 30 degrees minus uh, the 3.6652 radians per second times 0 0.120, and then we have the velocity that we need to put right here. So there's two adjustments to it. 3.867 meters per second. And so you can put in, well first of all you can get rid of the negative signs. And so the friction torque is just the mass flow rate. Well that's 0.125 kilograms per second times R which is L, which is 0.12 meters, times that velocity, 3.8674 meters per second. And so the friction torque, 0 0.058 Newton meter. Let's talk about pump problems. So it's an application of the angular momentum 
Um, here is the discussion of some geometry associated with the pump. This would be like a water pump, okay? So they'll bring the water in and then turn it and put it through an uh, uh, impeller section. That impeller section uh, has an inlet to it and an outlet to it, and it's rotating. It's going in a circular motion. If you turn and look at a frontal view of the uh, pump, you would have the water come directly into the plane, then turn 90 degrees in this I section, E-Y-E, -E, that's the I of the pump, and then get caught into this impeller, impeller section where you have different impellers. Often they're shaped like this. The study of the shape of those impellers, it's critical how the angle here and the critical the angle there, such that they optimize the smooth flow of water through or between the veins of the pump. That's what they're doing there. They don't want it to be um, causing uh, uh, separation and uh, zones of recirculation of flow in those areas, okay? The, uh, the, the impeller is rotating omega, okay? But one of the keys is, is to think about that the depth here coming down, that opening, but that depth is B. And so B is larger typically at the inlet and B at the outlet is a smaller uh, depth or height. Okay. All right. And just, as well as the R, the radius is much larger on the outlet. Well, once the water is slung out, it's thrown out with a high kinetic energy, then in this volute region, it's um, piles up, it slows down, and it comes out at a much higher pressure with roughly the same speed that it came in with is the same speed that it goes out. That's assuming that the diameter of the inlet and the diameter of the outlet are the same. Often in pumps, uh, you have a slightly larger suction line than discharge line. Not a lot, but just a little bit, and so it would be close to the same speed. But uh, inside the pump, the water experiences some tremendous increase in speed, especially when it comes off the tips. In this region, it has the highest speed it'll see. So they'll talk about these uh, centrifugal pumps as kinetic energy. They're not positive displacement like a piston cylinder reciprocating, but they're more of getting it to go to a high speed and then slowing it back down to build up the pressure. All right, so uh, how do we analyze this system? Well, this is the shaft right here, and so you have the rotation about the shaft. Well, you're going to have to supply a continuous torque, hence the mechanical power supplied to the pump is the product of that torque times the rate of rotation. They're in the same direction positive power into the shaft, into the pump, and that power is hopefully transferred as much as possible into increasing the mechanical energy of the flowing fluid. Some of it is wasted through the viscosity, through the viscous uh, effects, through that separation where the flow isn't uh, smooth along the veins, and uh, then it would come out slightly warmer then it went in, but that would uh, be a degradation of mechanical energy because you want the mechanical energy to go into increasing the pressure, the mechanical energy per unit volume of the flowing fluid. So there's a couple things to think about. You have this blades that uh, are rotating at a rate and they come in and catch the water. They kind of dig into the water, cut into the water in the eye region and then sling it out at the tips of the impellers. All right. So how do we analyze it? We would introduce a control volume. Here, it is truly a three-dimensional control volume. It's hard to see, but you, if you look down, there's a depth here, B1, and there's a depth out here, B2. Maybe I should show it over here, kind of the same, same geometry. B1. Uh, and then B2. And so the flow is coming out something like that, out 
on that surface and going in on this surface. Well, what they've done is they've shown you one vector for the speed of the fluid that's exiting through this outer surface, and then they decompose it into a normal component and a tangential component. The orientation is characterized by an angle, angle theta. That's with respect to what they call the radial direction. Here is the inlet decomposition or expression of the velocity vector. So you have the net flow coming in, and you can decompose it into normal and tangential. One of the things is, is your volumetric flow rate in has to equal to the volumetric flow rate out. It's incompressible, it's water. And so uh, this area in, what is the equation for the area in? Would it be 2 pi r1 for the length, the circumference, times the depth of b1? And then this velocity coming across at 1, this velocity that you need right here isn't the, to the magnitude of the velocity, it's only the normal component because the tangential just slides along the, it doesn't cross into the area. So AV1 is A1, that's how you would calculate it, and V1 normal. Now V1 normal may be given or you may calculate it from V1, but if you were given the magnitude of V1, you would multiply it by either the sine of alpha or the cosine of alpha to get V1 normal. What do you multiply it by? Cosine of alpha? Is it cosine of alpha? Okay. And likewise, if you're going to calculate the volumetric flow rate at 2, you could use the area at 2. That's 2 pi R2B2. And the normal velocity at 2, which you could relate to the magnitude of the velocity at 2 times the cosine of alpha 2. Now what about uh, this torque and what about uh, angular momentum? Well, we could apply the angular momentum equation, couldn't we, for that control volume? And so if we just uh, say that everything is in the positive counter, or I'm sorry, the positive clockwise direction, then I'll have the torque that's supplied by the shaft to this control volume to keep it rotating at constant speed is equal to the mass flow rate exiting, which is what? Going to be rho times AV at 2. Isn't that the mass flow rate exiting? AV2 times R cross V. So we're going to have that R vector cross V vector, but we want to uh, express it um, um, using a scalar notation. So wouldn't it be the magnitude of R2, the length of the radial, the radius R2, times V2 tangent? V2 tangent. That's why that other component's important. This component here is important for the moments uh, or angular momentum. This component's important for the flow rate across it. All right. How about uh, the other, on the inflow, we have minus rho AV2 R1 V1 tangent. Now, did I do that right? Oh, yeah, AV1. Sorry. Thank you very much. AV1. So there you go. Uh, so you could write it as uh, the rho times AV1 is equal to the rho times AV2. So you could just say, hey, the mass flow rate's the mass flow rate. What comes in has to go out. And then it's going to be R to V. 2t minus r1 v1t. True? 
torque in the shaft. Now, somebody says, uh, couldn't it be where V1 T is not in this direction that way, but could you ever have a case where it's this direction? You sure could. You just have to be careful, okay? It'd be like having a negative alpha 1. All right? Um, but uh, it's easiest to just introduce it this way, uh, that, that uh, it's slightly positive in this direction, and V2T is positive in that direction as well. Okay? So that's the equation generated by consideration of the angular momentum balance for that control volume. Ready to solve a problem? Let's just solve a problem. So we have a centrifugal water pump with impeller diameters of 14 centimeters on the inlet and 32 centimeters on the outlet. Uh, just what we were talking about. Be careful. This time they give you diameters. So hmm, let's go ahead and organize the information. They have D1 is 14 centimeters. So R1 is 7 centimeters. Okay. D2 is 32 centimeters, so R2 is 16 centimeters. And it rotates. We had a rotational rate omega of 900 revolutions per minute. We can convert that to radians per second, no problem. The volumetric flow rate, AV, is equal to 95 kilograms per minute. That 95 kilograms per minute, is it the same volumetric flow rate? coming into the impeller region equal to the volumetric flow rate leaving the impeller region. And it's because it's a water pump and water we consider is incompressible, density is constant. Assume the tangential fluid velocity is equal to the blade angular velocity both at the inlet and the exit. So uh, you, you have your idea of the center of rotation, the I region, that's R1, and then the R2 right there. And simply in, in solid body rotation, the impeller is just rotating, that sentence says the tangential fluid velocity is equal to, so the velocity at one tangential is equal to the blade angular velocity, the impeller angular velocity, which would simply be the rate of rotation times R1 in that case and V2T is omega R2. Calculate the power required to run the pump. So the power is going to be the shaft torque to drive it times the rotational speed. The shaft torque to drive it related to the mass flow rate or simply just put rho AV times R2 V2T minus R1 V1T. So if we substitute numbers, let's go ahead and do that. We have a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. The volumetric flow rate was 95, uh, what did I do? 95 kilograms per minute? Yeah, I can't use 95 kilograms per minute. That's either a mass flow rate or a volumetric flow rate. Which one do you want to make it? Make it a mass flow rate, then you're done with it. <laughs> wow, I didn't notice that. M dot, 95 kilograms per 60 seconds. Doctor, I know there's a few times they talk about flow rates and dissipation. They don't specify whether it's mass or volume. You just kind of got to guess. Uh, yeah, sometimes, unfortunately, the wording of the problems isn't as clear as it could be, but. That's right, you use the units. Let's continue on. So it's uh, point. 1, 6 meters times, I'm going to pull that omega out, so, well, or fine. Um, what is this V2T? We, it's omega 
So 900 times 2 pi divided by 60. I should have my calculator. I don't have my notes on this problem in front of me. Too many problems. Radians per second. And then multiply that by R1, what do you get for, and then multiply that by R2, what do you get for VT and VT1 and 2? VT2. Nope, don't even have my calculator today. Here, let me put this. Uh, let me put 94.25 times the um, R2.16, and that's meters as well. And then you minus uh, 0.07 times 94.25 times 0.07. Each of those have units of meters squared per second. And then we note that a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Second squareds go. Kilograms go. And so we're left with one Newton meter. So what do you pick up? Anybody run this number for the shaft? 3.09 sounds right. Newton meter, good. And then let's multiply it by that rate of rotation to calculate finally the shaft power needed to drive it. This is the minimum power. If there are any irreversibilities, if you have any of that uh, non-perfect friction flow, if you have some separation, then it will be greater. So what do you pick up for that? 291 watts. Let's see if I can get a couple thumbs up. Two, three, four, five. Very good. Six. Okay. That looks like it. Any questions on this problem? Yes, sir. Um, actually, this problem, they gave me the mass flow rate, and so... So we have a water sprinkler. This time it has two unequal arms. And they're at the ends of the arms, they turn 90 degrees, and then they spray water. But they don't spray them kind of backwards and forwards. They, they spray them in the same direction. So one arm is going to be trying to make it spin. What about this arm right here? Wouldn't it make it want to spin that way? What about this arm? Which way would it want to make it spin? So they're going to be counteracting each other. This is not a very efficient sprayer, right? It's not a good water sprayer for your lawn, but this is, no, but this is what we have for a problem. Also, one arm has a 4 millimeter diameter hole at the exit, and one arm has a 6 millimeter diameter hole at the exit. True? Different. It's, they're not symmetrical. As well as one arm is 80 millimeters long, and the other arm is only 40 millimeters long. Okay? Huh. So calculate the torque needed to prevent the sprinkler from rotating. That's the first part of the problem. So the sprinkler, you don't know exactly which direction it wants to rotate. This may be a guess that it wants to rotate in that direction. Okay? If it did want to rotate in that direction, you would have to apply a torque in that direction to prevent it from rotating. True? All right. Well, whichever direction do you want to assume it goes and whichever direction you want to assume that the torque has to be applied to the shaft to keep it from rotating, whatever you want to do, we have to pick one or the other. If this is the positive direction of the axis and we want to stay with the right-hand rule, this is a negative torque, true or false? 
True. Okay. Let's stay with that to help us get the orientation correct. So what we're going to do is introduce a control volume. This one's a lot easier because it's not even moving. And so because the control volume is moving, the water that comes across the boundary of the control volume is at the speed of the uh, um, at the speed that it comes out the nozzle. Okay. So let's take a look. Maybe we draw it coming here. Go here. Here is the one, here is two, that's its rotation. Uh, here is that uh, torque T applied. This is the fluid issuing out. This is the fluid issuing out. Just looking down at it, okay. So we're gonna have, uh, for, an, uh, for a control volume, angular momentum balance equation, we'll have negative T equal to and now, what do we have for, let's say, 1? Well, it's exiting the control volume. That's the control volume. So it's exiting the control volume. And uh, it's exiting such that I, I always think R cross V. If I look at this is R coming out here. And I have V is right there. And if I take and I do R cross V, which way is it going to be? It'll be in the positive or negative? Positive, isn't it? So it's, it's let me call this L1 for R1, because that's the syntax right there. And then we'll have V1. We didn't calculate V1, but it's the speed at which it exits, true? And then we'll have uh, the mass flow rate that uh, is going out to one. Did I do that part at least for that one? Now let's do it for the next one. Here is R2 and here is V2. About this point right there, R cross V is positive or negative? It's negative. Negative. Mass flow rate out the second arm, L2, V2. I got to pause. Is that okay? Or do I have an error? To understand, I know it's a little challenging. Why, why is it positive? Both of them are outflows. But one makes it want to rotate one way, and the other makes it want to rotate the other way. Okay. So now... Uh, is the mass flow rate at 1 equal to the mass flow rate out 2? Okay, clicker question. No, no, no. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same. My clicker question. Yeah, now that I answered it. <laughs> okay. Um, the book. Uh, comes the book is solving a problem like this and uh, they have an error in the solution they assume the volumetric flow rates are the same really what's the justification for that do this throw yourself back one chapter what was the name of the chapter right before this chapter on linear momentum and angular momentum what was the name of the chapter <laughs> Bernoulli Apply Bernoulli somehow, somewhere to this problem and see what it says about something about volumetric flow rates or velocities. And so what you'll do is you'll say this. I think I have a fluid packet come in here. That fluid packet's going to come up, turn, come out, and out. True? Okay, so this is the starting point. That's the ending point. If I neglect friction... It's not rotating or anything like that, stationary, right? Do you think I can write Bernoulli's equation from 1 to 2? Sure. We could say something about the pressure at 1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared. And I'm going to neglect. Let's start it right there because elevation is not a big deal. Start it right there for 1 so that you won't be bogged down saying, what about the elevation change? No, no. The pressure that drives this sprinkler is what drives it. That's not the head because there's some elevation change in the sprinkler. Okay, is equal to some constant, true? And so that goes out, and that could go to P2 
plus. Let me do this. I'm going to change this because this was 1. I better stay 1 with my notation. And this is 2 over here. I better stay with 2 over there. So let's put 0 for the beginning point. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm messing up your notation here. 0 and 0. And then we can go out to P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared. True? But you could also do a, a, a Bernoulli's equation from point O out to 2. True? And would that say that P0 plus 1 half rho V0 squared is also equal to P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared? What's the big assumption? I have no mechanical loss of energy. It's, it's conserved. That's Bernoulli's equation. I have no friction. True? So what about the exit pressure at 2 versus the exit pressure at 1? They're equal. What about the 1 half? The same. What about the rho? The same. If V1 squared is equal to V2 squared, does that mean V1 is equal to V2? Yeah. So basically from Bernoulli, you conclude V1 is equal to V2. That's a big step. If you make that step, then we can press forward. So what we can do is we can say that, um, that, uh, um, that uh, the volumetric flow rate A1V1 is equal to pi D1 squared over 4 times V1, true. And then I can say A2V2 is pi D2 squared over 4 times V2. Okay, that's great. I'm sorry? No, uh, this velocity right where it turns, it's under pressure. That pressure there. But... Um, so with, in real system, there's some frictional losses. It's just that this is a constant. It's equal to both. It's the starting point going out to 1 or out to 2. Okay. Um, I think there's some information missing in this problem, or what am I missing? I'm not given the mass flow rate or volumetric flow rate. Uh, you know what? Um, I'm supposed to have a volumetric flow rate of 0.4 liters per second. How come I don't have that? 0.4 liters per second. I don't know why it's, it's not in my problem statement. Do you see it somewhere in the problem statement? But I need a volumetric flow rate. Otherwise, <laughs> if the volumetric flow rate is zero, I don't need any torque. Nothing's shooting out. Yeah, I got different numbers. So let's just let's just run this one with 0.4 liters per second. So I know that uh, the total is equal to a1 v1 plus a2 v2. True. And I just I'm, I'm running out of room, but uh, 0.4 liters per second is equal to I got the pi, I got the d1, which is 0.004 squared divided by 4 times V1, let's leave V1 right there, plus pi 0 0.006 squared divided by 4, that's the area 2, times V2, which is the same as V1. So why don't I just pull that out? There's V1. And I can solve for V1. And so as the amount of uh, fluid, the volumetric flow rate that's forced up here, I, I'm assuming it's 0.4 liters per second, as that goes up, then V1 and V2 go up as well. So for this problem, we calculate it's 9.7942 meters per second. Let me pause and see if a few people can verify that. I had to introduce it. I left it off the problem statement. I have it. 
written on my note, but I didn't have it typed in to the problem statement. Somehow I left that line out. Sorry. Okay, uh, 0.4 liters is uh, 0.4 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed per second. Right? And so these are meters squared. This is a meter squared. And that'll give me this V1 in units of meters per second. One good, two good, three good, four good, five. Okay, I think we're good, okay? That's how you calculate V1. Notice again, if somebody says, no, 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 it's, it's 0.8 liters per second, what's going to happen? Your velocity out both ends are going to go up. It's going to be higher velocity. True? Okay, now that we have that V, uh, we can return to this equation, and we can find that T is equal to, I'm going to put uh, M dot 2 L2 V2 minus M dot 1 L1, V1, true? So we know the Vs. I like to put the checks. I know that. Great. How about do I know the Ls? Yep, I know the Ls. Ooh, I don't know the M dots yet, do I? So let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and calculate our um, AV1 and AV2. That's easy. Our AV at 1 is that pi 0 0.004 squared divided by 2 times V1. And the volumetric flow rate at 1 turns out to be 0 0.1231 liters per second. I know that moves at decimal place over by 3. Or if you run any calculator, it would be 0 0.0001231 meters cubed per second. Okay. And the volumetric flow rate at 2 similar, it's going to be A2, V2, is equal to 0 0.2769 liters per second. If you just stop for a minute, look at those volumetric flow rates. They're not the same. And so what, what we have is we have more flow out the larger diameter hole or la larger diameter nozzle. Okay, that sounds reasonable. So now, if I multiply those by rows, I get the density times the volumetric flow rate gives me the mass flow rate. And now I can substitute, and I'll get the torque is equal to the um, um, 2769. That's now kilograms per second for mass flow rate times L2. Uh, 0.4 times V2, which was 9.7942 meters per second. So that's meters squared per second. Okay. Minus uh, 0 0.1231 kilogram per second times that 0.8 times the 9.7942 meters squared per second. And I'm running out of room, but we calculate a torque to be 0 0.012 Newton meter. You need to co convert it to uh, meters. So, yeah, I need another zero right there. 0 .00, 0 .00, there you go. Thank you. Did I mess up on you? No, I was confused because the problems with 80 centimeters and the drawing was 80 millimeters. Right. Man, this problem, I typed it up too fast, huh? It's 80 centimeters, but it's 80 millimeters. Yeah, that would make a big difference on the torque. It doesn't make a difference on the flow rates. What matters on the flow rate is the diameter. The diameter is true. Okay or the speeds and the flow rates. All right, I have one confirmation, two, three, four. Anybody else? Five, okay, we're ready to go, thank you. Okay, let's solve this problem. Water flows into an initially empty tank of diameter 60 centimeters. 
at a constant flow rate of 12 liters per minute. A, a hole of diameter one centimeter at the bottom of the tank allows water to leave the tank. So what do we have is we have a nice big tank with a hole in it and we have a pipe that feeds some water to the tank and that goes splashing in and so the flow rate AV coming into the tank is a constant 12 liters per minute and there's the hole and I should put the tank diameter here diameter of the tank is uh, 60 centimeters that's a T tank and the diameter of the hole at the bottom is uh, one centimeter and the water can leave this hole drain out like that first part determine the maximum height that the water will reach in the tank so Picture the start, the tank starts empty, it's initially empty. You turn on the faucet, it starts to flow in at 12 meters per second, it just continually flows in at 12 liters per, se uh, yeah, 12 liters per minute. So now the water level is going to slowly go up, won't it? But as it goes up, what's happening? More water goes out the bottom. Uh, what happens when it gets to the maximum height? So we want to find that Z max, that maximum depth or height of water in the tank. That's above the hole, right? So what do we know about, uh, initially it'll start, the, the water level will build up, but over time, if you wait long enough, the water level will go up to a height and then stay there, true? What's special about that condition? Flow rates are equal. So you have this control volume. And when you've gotten to that steady state condition, the inlet flow is equal to the outlet flow right there. It should stay with the same color code. True? And that's the condition by which you can use to solve for the maximum height. So. Uh, at steady state, the volumetric flow rate in is equal to the volumetric flow rate out. I'm going to say out the hole, in the top and out the bottom. Okay? What is the, this is a constant. This, this up here is uh, 12 liters per minute. Uh, how do I calculate the volumetric flow rate out the bottom? The area of the hole times the velocity leaving or going through that hole. How do I solve for the velocity going out the hole? Use Bernoulli. And then you've seen it before and you develop uh, Torricelli's equation. Torricelli's equation. So what is that equation? Square root 2 G times the height of the water on top of it. In this context, we're looking for Z max. Now, you can redrive that equation. You don't need to memorize it. Maybe it's not on the equation sheet, but it's one of those that you used a couple times before, and you can quickly redrive it from Bernoulli's equation. So, uh, uh, this is AV on the inlet. So, you have A, V, the volumetric flow rate coming in. You divide it by the area of the hole in which it goes out. You square that. And then you divide by 2G, and that's our equation for Z max. True? Is that our equation for Z max? A little bit of algebra. So... Um, let's go ahead and solve for that, um, for this problem. I haven't asked any clicker questions today, have I? I passed up many opportunities to do that, and I just didn't do it. Um, here.
and I should chase my units, but I'm running out of room, so um, all of these will be in the meters for any length and seconds for time, and uh, you'll get that this Z max comes in at. Anybody else? Four or five. Okay, good enough. How about part B? Okay, well, write the differential equation that can be used to solve for the water height. Z is a function of time. Well, we know Z is going to increase, true, with time. Uh, Z starts at zero and then going to go to a maximum of 0.33 meters. So that's Z max. So what would be our equation? Our equation would be something like conservation of mass. In this case, because density is constant for liquid water, it's a conservation of volume, so it's a volume conservation equation. But we say the, the rate of change of volume of water in the tank with respect to time is equal to your flowing volume in constantly. And it's going out, but it's going out through a hole where the velocity is a function of the depth the instantaneous depth or height of water in that tank. So Z starts at zero. When it starts at zero, there's no outflow. And Z will gradually increase until it gets to its maximum, at which time the outflow equals the inflow, and there's no more accumulation or depletion. What's the volume of water in the tank? Well, it's going to be the area of the tank pi d of the tank squared divided by 4 times the height, which is z. So it's the area of the tank, time derivative of z with respect, well, dz dt. Then we have a v in minus area of the whole um, square root of 2g. If you like, you can stop that square root there and put z to the one-half power, if you like, but it's the square root of z is there. Um, you can pretty much stop there. This is the differential equation. What's a t? A constant, pi d at the tank squared over 4. What's a naught? Area of the whole, that's a constant. The volumetric flow rate in, a constant. 2g in, a, that 2g is a constant. And so you have a differential equation. Um, uh, you have, so this is your differential equation. Is it an ordinary? Yep, it's an ordinary. Is it a linear or nonlinear? Nonlinear because of that square root term. Um, what approach would you like to use to try to solve an ODE? Separate and integrate, right. Separate and integrate. Uh, what about the initial condition? You need the one initial condition because it's first order. What's the initial condition? There you go. You also know where it ends. It ends where at the max height of Z max. So you could renormalize it, but at, at this point, leave it alone, okay? Um, it's not going to be a pretty analytic solution. It's going to be a little on the difficult side to generate. Okay? AT, what is that again? Total area? AT is the area of the tank. Yeah, the tank area, which is pi diameter of the tank squared divided by 4. Because the area of the tank times Z gives me the amount of water in the tank, the volume of water in the tank. All right, we're done with that problem. Here's another water pump problem, but this one's a little different, so let's solve it. We have a 10 kilowatt water pump. It draws water into an 8 centimeter hose from a pond and then delivers it to a 2 centimeter nozzle located 3 meters above the water surface. Determine the volumetric flow rate through the nozzle. So, kind of organize our information. Here's our pond, and you have the water level in the pond. And we have a pump somewhere. It doesn't say exactly where the pump is. Maybe the pump is uh, on the ground right here. 
and you draw the water from the pond and then the water goes and there's a nozzle and the nozzle is right here and the nozzle uh, is located three meters above the surface of the pond. The power uh, supplied to the pump is uh, 10 kilowatts and the diameter of this hose um, that it draws it into let me just say that D is equal to uh, 8 centimeters and then the diameter of the discharge at the end of the nozzle is so let's put D sub N for diameter of the nozzle uh, 2 centimeters okay it asks ABC calculate the volumetric flow rate through the nozzle okay well what symbol would we like to use for volumetric flow rate AV I mentioned before some books use Q uh, you just have so many symbols for different things but AV is a good symbol for volumetric flow rate um, let's look at part B what is the maximum height the water jet will rise above the water surface so the water gets uh, sprayed out and then you're interested for part B is getting this H max true so that's what we're asked to calculate for part B H max that maximum height the water jet will rise or be shot above the water surface not above the nozzle not above the pump but above the water surface okay and then part C what is the horizontal force needed to hold the water or hold the nozzle if the water jet is directed horizontally over the pond so that changes the problem a little bit maybe for part C I think about uh, moving and I have it like this maybe I come out maybe I go through the pump the pump and then I continue on up and then I turn it like that and we have the nozzle and the fluid is now shot horizontally out and what we expect is is uh, <laughs> you're going to have to hold that nozzle in place and so we're asked to calculate the force F needed to hold the nozzle and that's a horizontal force F of H okay so let me do this I'm going to pause and I'm going to walk around. I'm going to see how many people can make a, an attack on this problem and see how far you can go on this problem, okay? So I think the consensus is, is we're going to use Bernoulli's. And so what we'll do is we introduce a streamline. And often when you're drawing water out of a tank or a pond, you start the streamline at the surface, water surface. Why? Because we know the pressure there. And we know the elevation there as well. So um, if I do Bernoulli, I start here and I just kind of go, 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 and I go through, and I go through this pump, and I go through this nozzle. I can stop right there, and then later for part B, I can stop right there. So let me start point one, point two, and point three. You're not going to like what I'm going to say, but listen up. Let's try and do it okay uh, right Bernoulli's going from point one to point two so we're gonna have the pressure you want to use energy per unit volume energy per unit mass or energy per unit weight just pick one right what's your favorite form of Bernoulli's equation per unit volume so it's pressure is a term so the pressure at one plus one half rho v1 squared plus uh, rho G Z1 plus we have a pump in between points one and two it's a head gain or a pressure gain so the pressure Delta P added by the pump the pressure gain added by the pump equal to the pressure at two plus one half Rho V2 squared plus Rho G Z2 now at this point 
I am neglecting frictional losses, so it's going to be a maximum volumetric flow rate that I'm going to be calculating. A high side estimate, true? Just okay. Now, what about the pressure at one? How about the pressure at two? Well, it's the discharge from the nozzle, isn't it? Uh, so, what's the pressure at two? The same as pressure at one. What about the kinetic energy component, the velocity at one, large tank? Done. Now, we can do this as we can say, what is the elevation at one? Zero. What's the elevation at two? Two is three meters. I, I, I'm going to play with your mind a little bit. What would have been the difference if the pump, I'm going to move this for a minute, if the pump would have had the hose, it would have come over here, and then the nozzle would have discharged up right here. Okay? Um, and then it would shoot the water up. Uh, this is, would it, would, let me ask this question. Here's a clicker question. Case A or case B, which one will have a higher, will attain a higher elevation for the maximum height of the water jet? Okay, so um, will case A uh, reach a higher H max? That'll be larger. If it is, answer A. Okay, will case B, where the nozzle is not located at three meters above the pond surface, but is located at Z equal to zero meters above the pond surface. It's just the pump is right there. It just brings a pipe up, the, the, the tube over, the, the, the hose over, and then the nozzle sits there at the water level of the surface of the lake and shoots it up. Um, and I'm asked to calculate the maximum it'll shoot. Will that be greater? Will, will, will H max for that case, uh, for case B, be greater than H max for case A? Then say answer B. Here H max for A will be greater than H max for B. Or answer C if they're the same. They're the same. So H max for B is equal to H max for A. Okay, uh, hopefully I explained the question. Let's go ahead and vote. Somebody says, Professor, I don't like it that you put it on the ground. Why don't you run the hose back over here and then turn it and make the nozzle go up right there? Yeah, that's fine. You could do that too. The water level, shoot. Yes. We're always measuring from the pond of the surface up for H max. Yeah. Pond of the surface up. Oops, polling stopped. Hopefully that gave you enough time to answer the question and get it in. All right, so they're going to be the same. True? In this analysis, they're going to be the same. True? Uh, why would they be different? Um, Okay, that was a long, elaborate, difficult question. Is there anything that I can help uh, to say why it would be the same? Because we're neglecting losses in the, in the um, frictional losses in the, in the hose. Okay, and okay, so uh, let's do this. Um, what is the volumetric flow rate um, for this case right here where z is equal to zero. Well, put that equal to zero. Or if it's three meters, another way of doing it is saying neglect the three meters elevation. So now what I have is I have the pump, okay, the delta p of the pump. What is the delta p of the pump when the pump is putting in 10 kilowatts? Oh, well, I have to be able to jump back and forth between pressure and power. So W dot of the pump, which is 10 kilowatts, is equal to the um, energy per unit volume times volume per unit time, true? Which is the delta P of the pump 
the pressure change across the pump times the volumetric flow rate, AV through the pump, which is the same AV through the nozzle. So I can replace this delta P from the pump. I can replace it by W dot of the pump divided by the volumetric flow rate. It's kind of a lot of work to get to that, that equation right there, okay? Uh, a few steps in logic. But what I can do is I can say this is the area at the exit of the nozzle times the velocity at the exit of the nozzle, true? So what I can pick up is I can get up the velocity of the nozzle at the exit of the nozzle cubed is equal to the power of the pump times 2 divided by the area at the exit of the nozzle and the density of the fluid. And then if I want to calculate that exit velocity, one-third power. You don't see too many one-third powers, but there it is. And so let's substitute numbers and chase units. So this will be equal to 10 kilojoules per second. That's a kilowatt. A joule, I'm just going to substitute, is a newton meter. True? So I turned a kilowatt into kilonewton meter per second. That's to save space. Uh, the area 2 uh, is going to be pi the diameter squared 0 0.02 meters squared divided by 4. The density 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed and a factor of 2. And I want to be very careful with my units. So uh, Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. I think that'll pretty well do it. So the newtons go, the kilograms go. I'll have a meter squared, which is a meter, a meter. This second right here and this second squared give me second cubed. And this gives me meters cubed. So when I take the cube root, I am left with V2 in units of meters per second, which is good on the units. It's a little bit to chase the units on this one, but they work. If you could do me a favor and jump on your calculator and see what you get for this answer, I'd appreciate it. 39.9, seem reasonable? Now that you know that, can you calculate AV, the volumetric flow rate? Go back and multiply A2 times that. Go back and multiply A2 times the V2 you just calculated. And you calculate the volumetric flow rate. If somebody can do that one for me. Twelve point five? Okay, now, what did we do that you may not feel comfortable with? We threw out the information about the three meters at the end of the nozzle. And so, yeah, we threw that out. All right. Uh, we neglected it. We basically changed where the nozzle is located on the exit discharge. But will this change the height at which it goes to? If I want to now solve for part B, what is the height maximum? Well, just take the longer uh, uh, Bernoulli, and so it's P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho G Z1 plus the delta P of the pump. Uh, we could have calculated that now. Um, if you want, you can go back and calculate the delta P that the pump gains, which is the 10 uh, kilowatts, kilonewton meter per second. <coughs> times the uh, uh, 0.0125 meters cubed per second. The seconds cancel. 
uh, you're left with um, 10 divided by 0 0.0125. What do you pick up on that? Uh, 797. 797 kilopascal. So you could put in here delta P of the pump, and you now know that it's 797 or 780 kilopascal, somewhere in that vicinity. Okay, so now it goes to P2 plus one-half rho V2 squared plus uh, rho GZ2. A lot of these terms are zero. The pressure at the inlet outlet, negligible, negligible at the top. That's where the water turns. It breaks it's zero speed. And then this is at the elevation of the lake. And so Z2 is Z max. And so what do we find for Z max or H max? Z2 is H max. It's equal to the delta P of the pump divided by rho G. So take and um, divide that uh, 797 kilonewton per meter squared by 9.81 kilonewton per meter cubed. And you'll get H max. What do you pick up H max to be? 81? Yeah, very high. But we're neglecting friction. I mean, that's what we're doing. You know the aerodynamics, and you're going to break up that water jet. <laughs> but, um, okay. Now, the horizontal force needed to hold the hose or the nozzle if the water jet is directed horizontally over the pond. Well, this is where we do the linear momentum. True? And so, in the interest of space, isn't that going to be the mass flow rate times the V exit, which is going to be, um, we already know it's, if it's 12.5 liters per second, what is M dot for water? 12.5 kilograms per second. One liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. And so it's 12.5 times that velocity. What is the velocity? Well, we calculated that to be 39.9. So it's 12.5 times 39.9. And so the horizontal force, the maximum, would be right at 500 newtons. Makes sense? All right. That was a tough problem, wasn't it? Made you think. Ready to go on? Oh, I don't want to do any more lawn sprinklers. OK, this goes back to chapter 4. So let's solve a problem out of chapter four. Uh, so water is flowing in a three centimeter diameter garden hose at a rate of 20 or 30 liters per minute, a, a nozzle of length 20 meters. So here's our thing, and then here is the length of uh, 20 centimeters. That's our nozzle. And during that nozzle, it changes so that it comes out at a much smaller diameter. So, uh, this uh, D here is 3 centimeters. The D here is uh, 1.2 centimeters. So D1 and D2, where this is location 2, this is location 1. The length of the nozzle is 20 centimeters. Uh, calculate the average acceleration of a fluid particle moving down the center line of the nozzle. So here's the center line, the little particles going. And what happens to the nozzle, or the fluid particle? He accelerates, doesn't he? But a steady state flow, how do we get acceleration? It's the material derivative, the material derivative. So do you remember the material derivative? And uh, so you had the acceleration is equal to V. And then you kind of remember, oh, no, what was this? expansion of the material derivative mathematically. 
of the velocity. It was something like uh, the derivative uh, with respect to time of v plus uh, u or, or, or uh, v dot del v, something like that. All right. And um, this term right in here, we're interested in uh, a sub x with that a scalar. And so it's the rate of change of u with respect to time. U, uh, v is equal to u sub i plus v sub j plus w sub k. uvw is the, the three components of the velocity. So it's that term plus what do we pick up for this, this uh, advective term in the material derivative? U, partial U with respect to X plus V, partial U. with respect to plus partial U with respect to Z. Now, we do have a two-dimensional problem, and it's really only a one-dimensional problem. So these are all gone, and this is gone. And so it's really, how do I get that term? So what is that average acceleration of the fluid particle moving down the center line of the nozzle? Well, um, it's this, how about U average times the change in U divided by the change in location. Wouldn't that be a good approximation for that acceleration? And so, you say to yourself, hmm, can I calculate U at 1? That will be the um, volumetric flow rate divided by A at 1. And so the volumetric flow rate is um, 30 liters per minute or 0 0.030 meters cubed per 60 seconds. And then you have the area at 1. Uh, pi 0.03 meters squared over 4. So you can get use of 1. Likewise, you can get use of 2. Let me see if I have those values for you. I, I calculated uh, 0 0.7074 meters per second. Okay. What about use of two? Uh, I'm sorry, that's use of one. What about use of two? Use of two is 4.421 meters per second. So what's U average? Well, something like 2.5642 meters per second. And then, so, so the acceleration in the X is the 2.5642 meters per second times the change. Uh, it went from 0 0.7074 up to 4.421 and then you divide by the length and it happened over a length of 0.2 meters and then you get a value for the acceleration to be 47.6 meters per second squared. Look reasonable or not? It's a, look reasonable? All right, I got just time for maybe one more problem. Oof. Or this one, let's go this one. Hold it, ah, shoot. No, let's skip that one. I don't have time for this one. <coughs> but uh, I'll read it and then not answer it fully, but a steady incompressible two-dimensional velocity field is given by 
So here's the U component, here's the V component, the I and the J make sense, all of that notation makes sense. And uh, these are the distances, X and Y are in meters, and the velocities are in meters per second. Okay, calculate the linear strain rate in the X direction. What's the linear strain rate? which is just a partial of u with respect to x. That's right. And then you look at it and you say, I can think I could do that derivative. If you take, this is u right here. Uh, so what's the answer? Negative 1.6. Okay, I've got to struggle with my units. Can you figure out the units? This one is meters per second, and that's meter. It is one over second, exactly. All right, we do have time then. How about the last one, the shear strain rate? What is the symbol for the shear strain rate? This was a linear strain rate. How about the shear strain rate? That? Okay, and what's it equal to? You do have the equation sheet available. You don't have to memorize everything, but what's it? E one half? The rate of change of? With respect to Y? Okay. So uh, here is U again. What's the derivative of u with respect to y? And what's the derivative of this is v right here? What is the derivative of v with respect to x? Zero. So the shear strain rate, zero. What would be the si units? One over second? The same as the other one, inverse second. Okay, could be inverse hour. Zero inverse hour is the same answer as uh, zero inverse second. Thank you very much for your attention.